Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 128 of ASBN Live, Female Fund Managers of Color Solving for Inequality in the Private Markets. I'm your host, Felicity Sivalinga, the American Sustainable Business Network's Senior Manager of Events and Programming. I'm thrilled to be passing it over to our moderator who put together this session, Jillian Gersley, who heads up ASBN's Investor Circle. So Jillian, please tell our audience about Investor Circle and a bit more about our panel we have here today. Amazing, thank you, Felicity. So again, my name is Jillian Gersley. I'm the manager of Investor Circle at the American Sustainable Business Network. Um, Investor Circle invests in early stage startups that help build a sustainable economy that is stakeholder driven, regener regenerative, just, and prosperous. Um, it's my pleasure to join you today on this panel of female fund managers of color solving for inequality in the private markets. Um, female fund managers of color receive as little funding as, as early stage founders of color, and this lack of funding is a critical issue that needs to be solved. Uh, today, you will hear from three inspiring fund managers, and I have to say yesterday, uh, we all had a conversation, and I was amazed and I know that this panel is going to be super engaging. So my plan as moderator is to say as little as possible so that I can soak in the wisdom of these three amazing individuals. Um, first, we will learn about them and what brought them to the field, uh, about their funds. Um, we're also going to get to hear a little bit about the Ally Capital Collab. And if you have any questions at any point, I encourage you to write them down, put them in the Q&A, and we will get to them at the end. Um, so thank you, Tracy, Gayla, and Azine for joining us. I'm, I'm excited about this. And Azine, why don't you uh, kick us off and tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay. Thank you, Jillian. And it's a real honor to be here, um, particularly with the panelists who I'm joining. So thank you for having me. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my eclectic background. And I'm, I've been spinning in my head since very early this morning how I want to share my story. And it's, always, it's different every single time. So I'm going to start with the idea of a red thread, if you're familiar with that. And in one's life, there's a red thread that if you look back, you'll often see it's the path that gets you to where you are. So you should have no regrets. And every step has led you to where you are. Where I began is as the daughter of Iranian immigrants, which I think is important for this panel today. They moved to the US well before any Iranian revolution. And I grew up though as, the, as a child of immigrant parents, which has lots of implications and tensions inherent in it in the Midwest in a very small town that was very unlike me and had that immigrant philosophy of hard work, education. I was diligent and did what I was supposed to do, went to university, went to Stanford, got my econ degree, worked in consulting, went to business school at UCLA, continued working in consulting. I was on the path. And then all of a sudden I got pregnant with my first child and made a huge pivot way back in 1992. And I want to actually recognize something. The moment I came out of college, the statistics for women in the workplace are exactly where they are today, if not worse. So as much progress as we've made, we all know in recent weeks, but just actually through the pandemic as well, it's all been wiped away. So I made a huge pivot. I became a stay-at-home mom, having two more kids and an excellent corporate wife. We made many moves. I lived in Europe, so I have that perspective as well as a non-American um, looking back at the US and also as an American living in a foreign country. So learned a foreign language as an adult, and then really reinvented myself as a philanthropist, as a school volunteer, as an educator. I coached many girls' sports and, um, and also began investing more thoroughly. In 2008, began angel investing on my own and did some direct investments, friends and family investing. And then there was the big change a few years ago, and I separate, uncoupled from my husband, launched three adult children who are now thankfully positive members of society and have been really thinking about how I want to lead my next chapter. And it has been with the idea of using all my lived experiences, my privileges, my knowledge, and my position to elevate other women and how I have best pulled it all together through the red thread is to say, 
let me work in a space where I can help other women be financially independent, financially sovereign, and actually also sexually sovereign. Those to me are the two key measures to make sure that women are equal. Great, thank you. Um, Tracy? Um, hi, everybody. Um, my voice, this isn't my normal voice, I have laryngitis. So if you see me go off video, it's not because I'm bored and I'm out. It's because I had to get water or something to not have a coughing fit. Um, so thanks, everybody, for be letting me be here on this panel with you and for being here. Um, I hope we have an, I know we will have an engaging conversation. And Jillian, thanks for being the catalyst for this. So I started, um, I'm a Air Force brat and brat is probably still a good description for me. Um, but I've been all over the world. I've um, lived in different places. Um, but I started my career as a systems engineer on the space shuttle program. So if anyone has heard me speak before, I'm always saying, you know, when everyone makes it complicated about changing the financial system and making it more equitable, I say it's not rocket science because I know what rocket science is. Um, but my career, I, I try to think of a, a thread, a red thread, but I am more like the dog that sees a squirrel and I'm just like squirrel and I just move to whatever interests me. Um, maybe that is why I'm now in venture capital and private equity, because I get to see a bunch of stuff that interests me. Maybe that's the thread. Um, but I left technology um, for a host of reasons, but um, ended up in the music industry um, because a friend of mine manages bands and I got to be backstage and I thought that's all you did as a band manager, which is not like all you do. It's hard work, but it ended up connecting me with a um, a, v a VC. Um, I didn't know what venture capital was. This was in late 1990, maybe 1999. And I didn't know what venture capital was. I didn't know what startups were. It was just not a big thing in LA at the time. Um, and he became, he, I worked for him in the music industry. He became a venture capitalist and he started investing in companies. And I, without having the language that I have now, I was just asking him, what are you investing in? You know, are these products or companies? I don't understand. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. And he asked me, instead of criticizing from afar, we'll pay you to criticize us. You can come in and be analyst associate. <clears throat> and then I found what I truly loved, which was venture capital. But what I didn't love um, were, were the statistics, which weren't really quite statistics people were talking about back then. But I, we would get about 300 to 500 business plans a month and I had to read through all of them as the first line of defense and then have the initial meetings. And I noticed I was only meeting with white men and everything I do is uh, the foundation is uh, justice and logic. I'm an engineer, that's where the logic comes. Justice came from my father and what, you know, being a black man in the Air Force, and Army and the United States, all that together, it just, if it doesn't make, if it's illogical, it makes my brain explode. And so I left, I literally left venture capital, which I didn't know that was a, you know, you shouldn't do that. I left because I was gonna start my own fund that was gonna invest in women and people of color back in the early aughts. And no one believed there were women and people of color in technology. They would look at me and ask me that question. And I would be like, but I'm a woman and person of color in technology. And you're asking me if I exist. And the stats that I later found out after I went to business school and I worked for an economic development nonprofit because I wanted to find the nexus between private capital and public good, um, which has been my journey since that time. But the stats at that point, I started seeing how little money was going to women and how few women were venture capitalists. 20 years later, the stats stayed the same. Well, actually didn't even stay the same. Some of them went down and it ended up which is statistically impossible when we know how many women and people, women of color are coming into the system. So I thought, okay, this isn't unconscious bias. This is flat out conscious bias. And instead of begging, shaming, conjoling men, white men to do the right thing, I just said, okay, we can just do it because women control 
the majority of the capital, 75% of the discretionary capital, but we don't invest. So I leave that to say, I also started a nonprofit. So I have my fund, the 22 fund, and then I, and we invest in manufacturing to increase export capacity of manufacturers. Our mission is to create um, the clean quality jobs of the future in low and moderate income communities and to um, increase generational wealth. And then I started a nonprofit called We Are Enough. Our sole goal is to educate women at every economic level around the world, how and why to invest in women-owned businesses or with the gender lens, because the path to changing the world is literally through women and especially women of color. And I will stop there. Thank you, Tracy. Gayla? Hi guys, this is Gayla, Gayla Jennings of Bern. Um, I'm a second generation black woman in tech and in business. Um, I grew up in Northern California, Silicon Valley during the early days of internet, Java, open source computing. And my world was one of women who were in STEM, who were in technology. Um, and so I saw the innovations of women uh, throughout the years. And I, no surprise, started my career in Silicon Valley as well, um, during the early days of uh, internet and Java and venture capital as well. And then um, from there went on to have a 20 plus year career on Wall Street, um, where I was an investment banker. Um, I also saw capital flows from the policy side as an international lobbyist. And then I saw capital from the philanthropic side, working for JP Morgan's uh, foundation for almost about 10 years. And in all of this, um, no surprise, you guys know where I'm going with this. In all of this, from Silicon Valley to Wall Street to government and policy and fiscal and monetary policy to philanthropy, there was still underrepresentation and undercapitalization of people of color and the sisterhood, to be quite honest with you. And so I left my um, job and my career at JP Morgan, and I decided I was going to do three things. I was going to champion for women, and a lot of that includes training and making sure capacity is there and capacity building uh, is there. I was going to invest, and that's the Walkstar Fund, which you'll learn more about today. And I would help with the stories of women and making sure that there was more stories about the success of women. Um, I started by saying that I grew up seeing women all around me. Um, and there's so many stories that um, aren't out there about what women contribute to society from a technology point of view. Some of you I know, and you've heard this before, so uh, um, bear with me, but here's three inventions I just wanna leave you with. Your cell phone, the caller ID, and the call waiting and then be able to add and merge calls was an invention by a black woman. The CCTV camera, and some of you might show up as a baby camera, baby cams, right? Um, might be the speed camera <laughs> that you're avoiding as you're driving. Um, that technology was a black woman, black woman in Brooklyn. Her husband took the late shift, make more money, uh, less desirable shifts, and she wanted to feel safe. And so invented the, uh, the uh, security camera. And then the third one I'll leave you with, since we're all now starting to fly when our flights aren't canceled, <laughs> um, is that call button that you press to get the uh, flight attendant's attention. That too was by a woman of color. The original patent she used to help Congress to be able to uh, uh, indicate which member of Congress or the Senate was speaking. Um, and it was this uh, light and button on the back of their chairs to indicate who was speaking. And that then morphed into the chair and but light and button that you press to get the uh, flight attendant. Um, so that's me, really excited to be here. Really wanna have an honest conversation. I know we're on Facebook, I'll try not to have a potty mouth, but I'm really, um, really glad that everyone's here and is open and willing to just have a real conversation and, and learn from each other. So thank you for having me. Thank you for those amazing introductions. I'm picking up on some themes, uh, championing women, championing women um, specifically. And I know that each of you were very intentional and thoughtful about how you set up your funds um, and how you create impact in your communities. So I'm curious to learn a little bit more about each of your funds, 
uh, what are you raising for and uh, how far along are you in the process? And um, we'll go in reverse order. So Gayla, I don't know if you wanna kick things off. Sure, um, so uh, I am a general partner, co-founder of a fund called um, Walkstar. It stands for Women of Color Stars. Uh, we are an early stage investor in uh, BIPOC women and diverse teams that are focused on the future of consumption. No surprise, 90% of uh, purchasing decisions are uh, influenced or made by women. And so they see the problems and therefore they build solutions. And so we're investing in those solutions that they're building. Um, we start with the things that we consume, be it data, media, um, to the resources. And so that picks up ag tech and food and things of utilities, energy, things of that nature. And then we also invest in the technologies and tools to allow those consumer consumption transactions to happen. We're not consumer goods, but we're all the consumer technology that um, make up that arc. We have been in existence and investing for the last two years. We've got 14 investments under our belt. Um, we've got three potential exits in the pipeline, one through an IPO, uh, two will be probably through public companies. Um, we are still onboarding investors. We've uh, started with individuals and family offices, and now we are um, onboarding some institutional investors. Um, and we are spending the bulk of our time right now making sure that our uh, portfolio of companies are recession-proof and are building uh, through these economic cycles. The good news is I've seen about four or five economic cycles, so uh, not scared about what's in front of us or what you guys are hearing on the evening news. Um, and as women, you know, particularly women of color, um, credit crunches, capital crunches, um, those don't really mean a lot to us because we just never had the capital or the credit anyway. Um, and you know, the stats around, you give us a dollar, we'll make three out of it. So um, we're feeling really good about our pipeline um, and uh, the fund itself. Did great. I answer all the questions, Jillian? I know you have yes, a few in there. Yes, did a great job. Uh, thank you, Tracy. Um, so as I said, we are the 22 fund. Um, the 22 is named after the 22 adults, women and men of color who founded Los Angeles, the Pablo Dordes. Um, and that's what the 22 comes from. I created the 22 because I wanted um, a strategy that wasn't copy paste venture capital that exists right now, um, but browning it, pinking it, blacking it. You know, I didn't want to do that because those that system of venture capital wasn't created by us or for us um, and really hasn't and has left a lot of us out. Um, right now, manufacturing, it's that non-sexy industry that is the foundation of our economy, which we all started to realize during the pandemic when we wanted more goods but the supply chain problem, the um, lack of capital for these companies, it, it causes a inability for them to pivot to the PPE we wanted, all the stuff we needed, they couldn't pivot to because one, a lot of their manufacturing was across the pond, or two, they didn't have any capital. There's an equity, what's called an equity gap, meaning equity capital, not equity around justice. And so I saw that this, um, manufacturing was so important to our economy, but I also saw that manufacturing is more tech-based and tech-enabled, which will allow our 90% of our workers in the country to get these skills around tech. Right now, Silicon Valley companies, the startups in Silicon Valley, Silicon Alley, Silicon whatever, um, the only people let in there are like all of us kind of elite people on this call or in the audience but your average worker doesn't have the skills to be at a software startup in um, San Francisco, but they can get the skills to be in manufacturing. So that was why we created this fund. We also found out that um, exporting companies, companies that sell their goods in another company in another country, but are located here, create jobs faster. They pay higher wages. On average, manufacturing is about $82,000 a year for workers, for employees. But when coupled with exports, it's $94,000 a year and more likely to have health care. 
Manufacturing is also more likely to be in low and moderate income communities because it's cheaper there. And so the jobs go to those communities. And the majority of people who export are people of color. So I bring that up because everything we want to do, the impact we want to have, creating the clean quality jobs of the future and low and moderate income communities and increased generational wealth all happens from our strategy. There's no concessions, there's no trade-offs. We're not taking lower returns. Matter of fact, companies that export have, um, higher, um, ret have higher revenues are less likely to go under during a recession because they're diversified in different markets. So we wanted a strategy that was high returns and high impact. One stat around manufacturing that people don't realize, there's a trope around manufacturing that there's no manufacturing in the United States. There is a lot of manufacturing in the United States. It is the foundation of our economy. There's also the trope that says uh, manufacturing is killing jobs. I mean, technology is killing jobs in manufacturing. That is not true. It's changing jobs. And so we aren't, are we're not keeping up with the skill set ne necessary for, for the jobs of the future. So I see manufacturing as like a back door for the employees to get into tech. And a, and a data set, a data point that I wanted to mention in the 50s and 60s, when there, you know, there was redlining around housing, there was, there was a white flight of workers from manufacturing in the urban core to the suburbs because women and people of color were allowed on the manufacturing floor. Once that happened, when the workers went to the suburbs, the manufacturing started to go to the suburbs. When that happened, we saw a 12% increase in the, wealth, in the wealth gap between white men and black men, just from manufacturing. That's how important it is to wealth building. So that is why we um, did this strategy. We are still fundraising. We're raising $100 million. One, the strategy could be 200 to 300, but no woman of color, I don't even know if a person of color, but no woman of color and I'm not even sure a woman has raised out of their first fund $100 million if they didn't spin out of some other fund. So I think the only woman is Serena, so she doesn't count. But otherwise, we have not hit that, that bar yet where men are raising it in no time. So I am, I want to, but I am constantly being asked, why are you raising so much money? I'm like, so much money. Some guy just raised $800 million in two weeks. And you're asking me, I'm telling me I'm raising too, so much money. So we really need to get past that bar. So that's, so we're raising $100 million. We just started investing. Um, we invested in two companies. We should have five more and super excited. So we, we think by the end of this uh, year, we will have the 100 million raised, if not in, in the first quarter next year. But um, we're real, I'm really enjoying it. I have great partners and, um, we, we, are, we see that we'll be able to make a huge difference. Thank you, Tracy. Azeen? Tracy, I've been looking on my screen to get the reaction mode, so I'll just be, do it here live. Whoop! So amazing uh, to you, and also Gayla, you as well. It's just, it's really inspiring to hear your stories and why you're doing what you're doing. We had talked yesterday about the idea of women being so deliberate and thoughtful about what we're doing. And you just heard the stories right there. When you're thoughtful and you are diligent and the change that you can make is impressive. So glad to be a part of this. I'm one of three co-founders and managing directors of a fund named Emmeline Ventures. And the name is a nod to a few ideas, basically though, it, we are making reference to historical uh, and fiction and nonfiction characters who we found doing some Google searches who happened to share both the name Emmeline, which we liked how it sounded, but they also shared these personality traits that we, traits that we identified with and really wanted to embody. And basically they were strong, opinionated women who buck the, tri buck the tide and uh, were breaking rules. And we thought that's the woman we wanna be and that's the woman we wanna build the future for. And, and there's, it, it's been really a great journey to just like pull in the whole cloak of an Emmeline personality and what we do. 
because it's a little bit different focus than what Gayla and Tracy have been talking about. We're approaching it not from the huge mega fund idea, but very focused on a micro fund. So something that's under $10 million, we're actually earmarking for fund one, a $5 million fund, which might sound like nothing. And at the same time, it is something because what we're really focused on doing is not only being female GPs, which is very low, you know, poorly represented in the venture capital market, we're looking to fund female founders, which again, as the stats have shown, are barely funded. I think it's under 3%, right, in, in the venture capital market. And there's a third silo in this whole venture capital ecosystem, and that's the female LPs. Those are the people who are investors in the fund and saying, here, take our money and invest it because we know that the returns in the venture space have been have been amazing over the past decade. This is where real wealth has been created for individuals and institutions and family offices. And we wanna get involved because the, I don't have the stats on this, but the, the representation of females as LPs, limited partners or investors in funds is really, really low. And so we have been very deliberate to say, if we raise a small fund, we can bring in more than, uh, more LPs at smaller check sizes, which is more attainable so that we can bring in first time investors into the space. Typical check sizes, you two know, um, your LP check sizes are probably six, high six to seven digits. And we're a five digit minimum check size, which is a huge difference for an individual. What we're also doing is really focused on the female lived experience and how we can find companies similar to what Gayla, you were talking about, the woman who so smart, her lived experience said, I'm at home alone and this doesn't feel safe. Let me think about what I can build to make my life better. And that was the camera. We're looking for those types of ideas that can help a female improve her standard of living by in three areas, looking to help her manage her health, build her wealth and live in a cleaner and safer world. And by elevating that female experience, we say we can invite, elevate the entire human experience. And that I think is in a nutshell is what we're doing at Emmeline Ventures. Wow. Um, all of you are doing incredible work and I wanna call out one accomplishment. I mean, I, I have a lot of questions, but one, one accomplishment, uh, Tracy, what will it mean for you to be the first woman of color uh, fund to raise a hundred million dollars and what will that mean for the community because that's that's a really big deal um you know i i try to celebrate everything personally but i'm not great at it so if we raise a hundred million dollars i would just be like that's nothing to celebrate me being the first one in 2022 right the, the first woman that it's ridiculous so but i would take them i'm a buddhist but i'm an impatient buddhist so i try to take the time I'd celebrate it would mean a lot because we've been working I've been working on this strategy for years um we're finding it's taking I forgot the stat but it's taking women two to three times longer to raise a fund um I have a classmate from business school who went out to raise his fund at the same time I did he I was told no for various reasons track record team never working together you know 100 million or under he went to some of the same one of the same lps and he has the same reasons that he should be told no but he was told yes and now he's on his second fund and he's raised 170 million or something um so i have a real time uh look at what the bias is so i i would celebrate because i need to be grateful and celebrate and i want to do that because i'm buddhist blah 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 but i won't feel i won't feel satisfied until this is not something to celebrate but at least we'll break that glass ceiling for women of color and that they won't people won't say 100 million dollars is a lot for us um did i answer your question Absolutely. Yeah. And I can I can answer from what this will mean for the community and the, the marketplace. Um, this will be a watershed moment. Um, there's a lot of funds out there that are trying to um, close and raise capital. There's a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, a couple of years, uh, a year before the pandemic, 
the last report by America Express around the state of women business showed that women of color are the fastest growing entrepreneurial community. Um, and yet, you know, as Azim talked about getting less than 2%, 3%, however you cut the numbers of capital. And so to have someone like Tracy um, be able to raise a hundred million will just ripple through all of those communities, the entrepreneurial, the banking, the finance, the venture, um, because we're at this point where we all know that this needs to happen and there's no economic rationale why it hasn't. There's no, you know, you, know, you, you look at business, you look at investing protocols and best practices, and, and, and there's no reason that says that we shouldn't be allocating in this way and that we shouldn't have people like that look like Tracy and with the experience of Tracy doing the work. And so we're at this point now with where we're out of excuses for why this hasn't happened. So it will be a watershed moment. Tracy may not be great at celebrating, I am. So I will, uh, <laughs> I will host the party if we need to, but it will be amazing. It will, it, it, it will be one of those uh, moments in history that I think for those of us who've been at this and for those on the call who've been at this a long time, um, we'll celebrate with her. Thank you, Gayla. And then I wanted to specifically call out your track record um, and the number of exits you've had or that you have in the works. Um, and given your success, it sounds like raising capital should be a breeze. And I'm curious to hear how someone with such a proven record of success, how, how that raise is going for you um, with your fund. Yeah, um, it's been harder than we thought, and it's been longer than we thought. The investors that we have uh, on board are amazing. Um, the people that have invested to date not only understand the space that we're in and the founders that we're backing, but they understand the impact of what we're doing and the potential um, upside that uh, it, it entails. And so for the people that have come on board, it's been amazing. And there's a few of them on the call here, Rosalind and Andrew Bellick, thank you guys so much for being here. Um, but what we're finding is that for many people, because they haven't seen these entrepreneurs before, um, they haven't seen enough women of color, walk stars, um, get to unicorn status, IPO, right? Um, because they haven't seen it, it's hard for them to wrap their heads around it. So one of the things that we did early on is we said, if you're going to invest, invest now, sign your documents and write a check. And that's given us the, the dry powder, if you will, to make investments. So we're still raising, we're still onboarding investors, but every investor that's come in understands what we're doing and has provided us the capital to start making those investments. And so that's why we have a portfolio of 14 companies right now. Um, but I will say the place where I've been most disappointed, if you will, has been um, impact investors, foundations, um, because they identify as, as impact investors, they identify as wanting to be involved in diversity and inclusion type um, investments. And for foundations, it's you know part of their mandate, but yet and still, they're some of the most risk adverse in that they are waiting to see the others come in. They're wanting validations from the JP Morgans and the soft banks and sales forces and the Googles of the world. And so my call to action to them is live your truth, live the identity that you embrace and be that catalytic capital that you claim to be. Um, but otherwise the um, capital raising, um, it's exhausting, but what I find joyful is the people that truly wanna understand this space um, and come into it with that curiosity and energy and excitement. And those are the people that we, we rock with. Awesome, thank you. Um, Zine, in your deck, you talk about how female fund managers outperform men. Uh, talk to me about that data, and can you share some insights on why uh, this performance data isn't working? 
Okay, sure. And I, the, I'll i tackle the first part and I'm going to ask you a question about your second part of the question. But I, some of the data has been talked about already here and I want to, I'll start at a global level. Um, the data has been here and it's been here for decades and it's something that Tracy and Gayla and I talked about yesterday. It's almost an eye roll that we have to continue telling people all this data to, it's, it's, you know, it's defending ourselves to say, look, come invest with us. We know what we're doing. This is the smart decision. And um, yet for us, we're still pushing the data because maybe there's people who still need the education that studies have shown, for example, if women participated at the same rate as men as founders, global GDP would increase, um, would rise by three to 6%. That's incredible, right? Like the whole idea of Emmeline saying, if we enhance the, the lives of women, we advance the lives of humanity. It's just saying it now with the data to say data shown. Yeah, we're gonna be better off by a few trillion dollars uh, if we bring in women at the same funding rate that we do men. So going from 2%, you know, uh, increasing them to the 50% level. Another data stat that anyone who's a smart investor and thinking about what she or he wants to do with his money, women-led founder teams, they generate generally a 35% higher ROI than an all-male team. Like, why wouldn't you think about, that's um, just, it's, it's absurd why people, more people aren't flocking to this space. And um, also what's very important in, in private equity and in venture capital is exits, right? The timing to exit, you wanna get your money out as fast as you can, basically at the highest multiple you can. And women tend to generate exit, women-led companies exit at a faster rate than, than all male-led ones. So there's compelling reason in data after data that support this. And then your question is why, can you repeat your question, Julie, in the second half? I'm muted. Um, I guess I, I was just wondering why, if if it's clear that women outperform men, why isn't that performance data working? Why why isn't everyone pouring money into to female led funds? Right, and um, and so my experience, our experience at Emmeline Ventures has been that we are getting the males to invest with with us. But the stories I'm hearing that Gayla and Tracy have already mentioned about the idea of a, a classmate getting a yes when she got a no for the exact same reasons, we haven't been there yet. So from our experience, it's hard for me to answer. I can make hypotheses on why, and and I would just say it's there's biases that are difficult to change in people, and there are patterns that are difficult to change. And I will go on a non sequitur because I feel like sometimes it's an interesting way to deliver an idea. I was reading an article about legacy admissions at top selective universities and the idea that you would no longer allow a legacy um, privilege or benefit to college students is a very difficult one because for those who are in charge to say, we're going to drop this clause, this, this perk, they're they're choosing for the greater good rather than their individual. And I think that takes a very large, mature person to understand the benefit of that greater good. Awesome. Um, yesterday, we talked about the importance of engaging a wider pool of men, specifically white men who have additional access um, to capital. And uh, Gayla, I would love for you to share a little bit about the Ally Capital Collab um, and I know you have a couple of slides, so we'd love to hear a little bit about that. Sure, happy to. And uh, guys, bear with me while I um, share my screen and put on the present mode here. Um, one second here. Um, I'll start by saying, as it's coming up, um, we, we, and the folks that you'll, uh, I'll be talk, uh, telling you about, started the Ally Collab because we saw this inefficiency in the market. Um, place around how capital flows. And so we wanted as a group to be able to come together as women collectively and share how that, how we can change it together. Um, can you guys see my slides? Let me know if they're up on, on screen. Okay, great. Not yet, not yet. Not yet, yeah. Not yet, okay. Give me one second, let me try it one more time here. Again, bear with me here. 
trying to be cute and do a couple of things at once, which probably isn't working. Okay, so I'm going to start by sharing the screen and then I will uh, blow it up into more presentation style. And we see it now. Okay, great. Let me get to page one. Um, so uh, no surprise, women are very collaborative, right? We believe that we can all win. And so we came together with what we're calling the Ally Capital Collab. And our mission is to change the system, as we've been talking about, that's crippling um, investment into funds by women and women of color and entrepreneurs. And we're drawing lessons from the legacy of black and brown women who historically have driven social change. We stepped back during COVID and thought, how has changed happened before and what lessons can we draw from that? And so our goal is threefold, to inform, train and mobilize a community of allies. Um, we wanna democratize who participates and benefits from the success of BIPOC people. Um, we wanna provide a well-vetted portfolio of BIPOC fund managers to the marketplace. And we wanna increase the funding and number of BIPOC women that are check writers. You know, currently, if you think about it, guys, the, the burden is on investors in many ways to try and find us, right? You guys have relationships with your private bankers, with different institutions, wealth managers, right? Um, and those markets in many ways are failing you in terms of how you can find us. They'll get you into Google, they'll get you into Alibaba stock, right? They'll, give, they'll sell you some more Facebook slash meta stock, right? But how do you find where some really exciting investments are taking place? And so we thought we, we can help solve that and in turn solve the problem for BIPOC uh, founders and fund managers. And so that market reality is what this slide talks about. And again, the market is failing all of us. It's failing you as investors and how you're finding new and exciting opportunities. It's relying on you to have the due diligence capability to go out and due diligence all of us. There's limited access to information provided by financial institutions or your pension fund. And there's over dependence on third party decision makers. And guess what? Those third party decision makers don't have any more insight into folks like Azine and Tracy as they should. And then likewise, we know what that looks like on our side as fund managers, we're not connected in an efficient way. And so we're knocking on every door. And I, I tease people and say, you know, Girl Scouts actually have a pretty good model. If you think about it compared to VCs, right? We're knocking on every door. Girl Scouts know exactly where to go, sit in front of Safeway or <laughs> Kroger's, right? Give a box to their dad to take to the office, right? We in venture haven't figured out um, how to do this well in terms of how we distribute and allocate capital. And so the impact is you as investors are not able to allocate the DAFs in the way that you intended to. Only 23 billion out of 121 billion was allocated in 2018 you're missing out on the potential for 30% higher returns and 30% faster exits. And you're missing out on the outperformance of mixed gendered companies versus men only investment teams and men only founder teams. Manoj, you had in the, um, sorry if I mispronounced your name, you had in the, the comments, why is that? With a quick answer, Diverse talent, diverse life and career experiences is a competitive advantage if you're going to go out and capture market share and build companies. You can't take two white guys, roommates from Harvard who drop out to, and think that they can build the next femtech company or the next media company. The world doesn't look like the consumer base in which you're selling into, the supply chain in which you've got to buy from is diverse. And so having that diversity is your competitive advantage and gets you those returns that we as VCs are looking for to generate for you, our investors. And on the climate side, it's having an impact as well. And Tracy can talk more about this. But if we don't get this right, guys, we are having a hit of 18% to global GDP from climate change. We are lost out on adding $507 billion 
to our GD, the US GDP because we did not invest in black women. Now we can fight in DC all day long about who pays taxes and who's gonna pay for social services and if we tax the rich or the 1% or all that. I'll let those guys fight over that. What I wanna be about is adding to the GDP so that we can pay for those things. And we collectively have done a bad job of that. The other stat I just wanna point out here, 16 trillion lost due to systemic and societal racism. I don't know where you sit on the racism spectrum, but I gotta believe we all would like to have an economy that's healthy, thriving, growing, and that the US can raise its competitive ranking in the world again. Right now we're sitting at ninth place. And I don't wanna bum you out so I didn't put all the education and <laughs> housing and wealth gap stats on here. So anyway, Ally Collab is focused on this. And the way we're focusing on it is, and why, is because we know that when allowed, women, and particularly women of color, when allowed to take the reins around social change, we get things changed. Tracy, I'm gonna stop and see if you wanted to add anything here about this. Well, um when Gayla came to me about this, we discussed, you know, what are women of color allowed to be successful at? We're allowed to be successful and raise money around being out the vote, organize on the ground, saving democracy, that we're allowed to do. So we thought, why not take the best practices from how women fundraise on the ground around organizing and bring it into venture capital? because it's just not working for us. The system has so many points of barriers. And I'm gonna put in the chat a um, article I wrote, co-wrote about why, it's called why, how, fund, how foundations are failing diverse fund managers and how to fix it. That, I'm putting that in the chat and I'm also putting in the due diligence 2.0 commitment in the chat because it also explains it's the due diligence process that is part of the problem. So Ally Capital Collab came together to, okay, let's forget about that due diligence process. And we due diligence each other. And then we use the learnings and best practices as a pilot for four funds, two black women, two brown women who are innovating, have different fund types that fit what people of color are doing. And that was why we came together to do this and, and especially around climate, um, the people who are being hit the hardest from the climate disaster we're in are women of color around the world. They and people of color, these are the frontline communities. So therefore, we know of the solutions because we're experiencing the bad. We know the solutions to, to impact this, but we're not being funded to do this. We're funding a bunch of white guys and some, uh, some white women, I have to say there are white women that are getting money and people are checking off their diversity box who haven't experienced all these impacts, but we're saying they can solve the problem. So it's illogical once again to me and unjust. So that's yeah. my, what I want to add. Go ahead, Gayla. Thank you. And just to close this out um, for people that may be interested in getting involved with us, um, and supporting us. Uh, the Ally Collab is doing three things programmatically. Um, there's a research component in which we wanna bring out more of the research around how long it's taking and why, um, to do uh, some of the chat in there, why it's taking longer for women of color to raise funds. Uh, we've got a great uh, team that's gonna be, that we're commissioning to work on that project with us. So we'll be looking for funds to help support that. We're also um, doing something innovative around democratizing who can support. You know, most of the way, again, we talked about the inefficiency in the markets, not only for fund managers, but for the investors. But there's also a lot of people on the ground who say, I want to help. And maybe they're not accredited investors, right? Maybe they have a DAF and they want to learn a little bit more about this space before putting other capital to work, right? And so what we've done is a very innovative approach is we've set up an endowment, basically a public charity by which people can donate to support the funds and the work that we're doing. 
the programmatic work that we're doing. And what's been beautiful about that is it's been a way for people across the country, they don't have to be accredited investors, right? They can donate in the same way that they donate to their um, local charities. Now they can donate $5, $1,000, a piece of artwork, a Bitcoin, and they can be supportive of venture and the investing that we're doing in women. And so that's what this arc is here. So if you or clients are thinking about wanting to support, we now have a way that you can do that from donated capital until maybe you're ready to come in directly into funds. And so I really put that out to the investor circle um, to really think about as a way to get involved and use that as a way to familiarize yourself and involve yourself in the work that we're doing and getting to know this space. And then the last part of this, of that third goal, is we want to see more female fund managers. We want more women that are women investing in women. And so we've got really good curriculum and training that we're going to be launching next year for new cohorts of uh, emerging female fund managers. And then I'll leave you with the last slide to just show you uh, a little bit of how we talk about this in the marketplace, which is if we change the capital flow, we wholeheartedly know we will change the world. And if you donate, we invest, businesses grow, and everybody wins. Thanks for letting me share a little bit of what we're doing. Thank you so much. That really, um, I really wanted to get to the, the why of the conversation, which is, you know, why is it beneficial to fund female fund managers of color? And I think you hit on some really strong points. And if you weren't a believer before, then the 18% hit to the global, global GDP and the 16 trillion loss due to racism, um, I think will resonate with with everyone. So thank you for that amazing presentation and for all the work you're doing with the Ally Capital uh, collab. And I know we're running short on time, but I wanted to touch, I, I didn't think that we could get through the conversation without um, sort of asking the question of, given all of the recent current events, such as you know war in Ukraine, inflation, Roe versus Wade being overturned, um, as briefly as possible, because I know that we can talk about this forever. How does your thinking as a fund manager, like how is that impacted um, by what's happening outside of the financial system? And Azine, I'll let you start with that. Sure, and I'm before I answer this, I wanna make sure that we feel comfortable. There are three questions in the chat and I think we've addressed them all. Um, just to show of hands by those panelists, do we need to cover them at all? I wanted to add something um, about the question on why, because this is a mention to me about why there's higher ROI from female-led funds and why we hypothesize that so. And Gayla mentions it in, in her way. And I'll just point out that when you have a diverse group, you have diverse perspectives and you see things that are um, along the full spectrum and, in, and a savvy investor is not narrow, but is broad in looking at all the possibilities that are out there and allowing all the voices to enter into the discussion. And women tend to be, as we mentioned, more, more collaborative, more empathetic, more willing to listen and perhaps more prudent in their investing style. So I would, those are my, suggestions as to why we're doing better, which will segue me into with all the turmoil that's going on right now in the markets. I think, and also remember I'm old and we've talked about, um, I've seen a lot and have been through lots of different cycles. For me, I'm looking at the period right now and thinking, ooh, this is exciting. Lots of turmoil, lots of down value. This is an excellent time to have some cash and to be making some investing, particularly in ventures, since we have a longer term horizon. We're put, we at Emmeline are investing in pre seed and seed stage com companies. Those are smaller. They have, let's say, a three to seven year time frame before there's going to be a substantial exit. By that time, we're crossing fingers that the world economy will have stabilized, settled, and perhaps grown back again. 
And um, we're very fortunate and thankful to have um, to have already made a first close. We have money in the bank that we can invest after already of investing in four companies. We're looking to um, actually try and deploy more capital as quickly as we can while we're in this um, down market. So that I, I'm contrary to looking at my own public uh, publicly traded stocks, my own portfolio on that end. No need. I'm a long term investor personally, and for venture capital, it's all about the long term and taking advantage of the market opportunities where they are. You always want to be off cycle. Thank you. Um, for for me, our strategy is what um, the Brookings Institute, some of the Brookings Institute said is recession proof strategy. So when you're diversified and you're selling to markets around the world, when one market is bad, another one is good. Um, and even when the whole world go, you know, goes into recession, the last great recession, companies that export did really well. Um, the second part is um, the, the Biden administration has, and every administration really, they know how important manufacturing is, but the Biden administration has really put money, lots of money behind manufacturing and infrastructure. So not only are our companies being supported from our capital, they're being supported from the federal government, from the state government and local governments. Um, so we haven't seen the same, we're not experiencing it because it's also a long-term game, but it is more important than ever to invest in people of color and these low moderate income communities because when the world gets a cold, people of color get COVID, right? We get it really, really bad. So if anything, people shouldn't be pulling back their money from the um, areas that you are, the research shows you will make more money, people should be flo really flocking into diverse founders, diverse funds, diversity, 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 as a risk mitigation strategy for your portfolio. Awesome. Gail, I don't know if you want to answer that. I see you uh, typing some answers in the chat. So maybe, maybe we can pass you one of those. Andrew wrote, what would it take to become an evergreen fund? Some more multivitamins. <laughs> um, it, there's nothing that wouldn't prevent us from being an evergreen fund. I think where our thinking was um, when we originally started this, Andrew, was we're such an anomaly in the space anyway that if we get any more exotic, off of traditional funds, it will just blow people's brains. <laughs> like it's enough to just walk in the room and be a black woman who's had a 20 year career at JP Morgan and still have to defend a strategy and showing them through all our financial models and our portfolio itself and still get them to a place where they would go, hmm, maybe I should put some capital into that. And so we just thought, let's keep this as simple as people know it um, without trying to explain even more things. So um, that was our rationale why we didn't go evergreen, but I don't think there's any reason why we couldn't be um, you know, maybe that's fun too. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. Another question we have is, how do you recommend leveraging the universities we have attended to help us build? How should we approach them? Yeah, great question. So I'll take first out at that. Um, when we built our um, fund early on, I went to my alma mater, Wharton, um, and Wharton Social Impact, where I'm an innovator in residence, and I go and guest lecture and speak with uh, MBA and undergrad students and in the different classes, um, uh, business classes there. And I said, hey, listen, I grew up in JP Morgan, so I know mechanics of, a due, of due diligence. And I said, you know, I lived in data rooms for, you know, the first few years of my career. I said, but one of the problems that women have is market validation. Now market validation can come in two ways. Someone picks up the phone and says, hey, Bob, you gotta check out this, this company, they're really good. I just put some money in. And they go, what? Okay, well, if Elon's in there or Bob's in there or Bill's in there, yeah, I'll, I'll throw some money in too. The other way validation happens is if one investor VC says, hey, we due diligence them, we're going in. 
And someone's like, oh, Sequoia's in there, Precursor's in there, you know, Andreessen's in there. All right, maybe we should go in there. And so we thought, hmm, how do we provide that for women of color? And so we worked with Wharton to build out our due diligence. Again, I could have easily just done it because I've been doing it, you know, and, and was trained by JP Morgan on how to do due diligence and, and navigate through data rooms. But we purposely used Wharton to help and Wharton MBA students and the vice dean to help us build out our due diligence so that if people can get through ours, which is very rigorous and comprehensive, and we've got scorecards and rubrics and decision trees and weighted, you know, all these things and uh, feedback forms to go back to the, to the entrepreneurs and stuff. If they can get through ours, hopefully in a few years, people say, ah, you got through Walkstar's due diligence. All right, yeah, we'll take a serious look at you. Uh, but that's one way that we're working with uh, academia. And then with Ally Collab, we're gonna be working on them on this research that we're trying to get funded that really delves into why is it taking so long? What the heck is going on? And then I'm not sure if you've already answered this, but someone wrote that um, another of the earlier funds in the space has had to dramatically cut back their staff and they cited difficulty raising capital given the current economic uncertainty. Uh, what are you all doing to make it through this economic turbulence? Um, I, would, I would answer that because we all, I mean, I think most of us know what fund that is. That's backstage capital. Um, you know, what I, we had a discussion yesterday that we've been very intentional about our strategy and the impacts we want to have. Um, there, there are funds that have taken what Silicon Valley does and then browned and blacked and pinked it. I'm not sure that is always going to be sustainable. Um, and the system has issues with that. I think, um, we all three have very intentional strategies that are sustainable, that will last through economic downturns and upturns. That's what we did. Most venture capital will experience problems during downturns. That is just another fund. Doesn't matter what color, what gender, what uh, um, gender identity, it doesn't matter. If it's the same strategy and the same in that system, it's gonna hit be hit. We have strategies that we believe are not going to be hit um, in the same way. Thank you. And I'm, I'm going to add to that because I think all, all the women in the room and listening can understand this. Like most women who are running something and um, a startup, like we are with Emmeline Ventures, we are fairly young. It, we're, we're managing a few different side gigs as well. Emmeline Ventures is not... Um, paying our way at the moment. And we're doing this out of full passion and for the, the long-term upside that we see that we can both make money and make change. So in terms of having to cut back staff, well, we're not really being paid anyway. So, <laughs> you know, we just keep plugging along like most women do and adding more to our plate like most women do. Awesome. I think, um, Zine, you already answer, answered uh, Manju's question, right? Okay. I believe so. Yes. I hope right. it feels comfortable that I did. Amazing. Well, I know we're a little bit over, but I really enjoyed this uh, conversation and thank you. Thank you for staying over and thank you for sharing your, your knowledge and your wisdom. And hopefully you can get more people to invest in your funds and uh, uh, women fund managers of color in general. And thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank, thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye-bye.